What's up, you guys? Welcome back to Five Questions with Conan. Although, I guess technically we are uh, doing three questions at this point. I'm sorry I haven't been making a ton of videos uh, recently, by the way. Um, I'm actually going to be posting a lot, but recently I haven't been able to record that much because I've been having a lot of different skin problems, and obviously I've been having this ongoing uh, eye problem. But hopefully I'm starting to get some of those a little bit more resolved. And so why don't we just jump straight into the questions and get into this. Uh, obviously, last time we got basically two out of the three questions correct so hopefully this time we can get all three questions correct so let's see how it goes this time so a 67 year old woman undergoes follow-up evaluation for an elevated globulin fraction of total serum protein level interesting already starting to think like oh multiple myeloma things or something like that uh, spep and immunofixation show an igg monoclonal spike of 0.7 uh, serum free light chain and 24 hour urine protein urine electrophoresis are normal. Skeletal survey shows no lytic lesion. So, already they're addressing all that multiple myeloma that I was already thinking about. And sounds like it's not multiple myeloma based on all this stuff right here. So, which of the following is the most appropriate management? A kidney biopsy, MRI of the cervical, thoracic, and lumbar spine repeat lab studies in six months, or serum beta-2 microglobulin eye measurement. So in this case, uh, you know, I'm not totally sure what the kidney biopsy is really going to be addressing. I'll have to read the, the prompt a little bit more. Uh, the B question is basically saying that you do still think this is uh, multiple myeloma and you just think that the skeletal survey missed um, some lesions. I, I'm assuming is what the MRI is trying to look for. Uh, repeat lab studies in six months is probably what I'm leaning to right now. Uh, and then serum beta-2 microglobulin. Uh, interesting, you know, I know beta-2 microglobulin is associated with like dialysis patients. They can get de deposition of serum beta-2 microglobulin. Uh, I'm not really sure what the utility of it is in working up this um, elevated protein uh, or globulin uh, fraction, um, especially this microglobulin I specifically. I've never heard of that. So anyways, she has no symptoms. Medical history is notable for hypertension treated with hydrochlorothiazide and atorvastatin. On physical exam, vital signs are normal. No lymphadenopathy or hepatosplenomegaly is noted. Hemoglobin is normal. Leukocyte count is normal. Platelets normal. Calcium normal. And creatinine is normal. So in this case, um, I think it's fair fairly obvious that, you know, they're trying to give you all this information that this person does not have multiple myeloma, right? They don't have any crab symptoms, no hypercalcemia, no renal insufficiency, no anemia, and no lytic bone lesions. So I think we can already very easily rule out B. Um, what I do think this is, is probably going for MGUS or monoclonal gammopathy of undetermined significance. Um, and that's because, you know, it's undetermined significance right now. This patient has no symptoms. They're like completely healthy. Kidney biopsy, I'm not totally sure what they're trying to go for there, but uh, I'm pretty sure this answer here is pretty simple um, to be C. And uh, yeah, you can see the majority of people picked C in this one, so not too, not too complicated of a question. I like this uh, information here. The risk of progression of MGUS to multiple myeloma or other lymphoproliferative disorders is determined by various risk factors. In this patient with IgG MGUS, an M spike of less than 1.5 grams per deciliter liter, and a normal serum free light chain ass assay, the risk of progression is low at 5% over 20 years. In regards to the kidney function thing, uh, they were saying that there is a condition basically which is monoclonal gammopathy of renal significance. Um, and you, this may be an indication for a kidney biopsy, but this patient has completely normal kidney function, no proteinuria, so no kidney biopsy is indicated. All right, moving on to our next question. A uh, very short question stem. I love this. From what I've read, MixApp's question stems tend to be pretty short uh, compared to UWorld, which has very, very long question stems. And actually, on the actual board exam, apparently they're a little bit more in line with the length of MixApp questions rather than uh, UWorld questions. So a 47-year-old woman is evaluated during a follow-up visit for major depressive disorder that was diagnosed two months ago. At that time, she reported a four-month history of anhedonia, depressed mood, decreased energy, insomnia, and weight loss. Her PHQ-9 score was 14, indicating moderate depression. She was prescribed sertraline and her symptoms improved. Her PHQ score is now 9. However, she is distressed because she has had anorgasmia since starting sertraline. Most common side effect of SSRIs is not nausea or vomiting or GI symptoms, which is what you see in most medications, uh, but is actually going to be sexual dysfunction. And so um, that's one learning point to take from this question here. Which of the following is the most important next step in management? 
So A, continue sertraline and initiate cognitive behavioral therapy. That's not going to address the anorgasmia, so that's definitely not it. Discontinue sertraline and initiate bupropion. That's definitely the answer I think I'm going to go for because bupropion, the main thing about bupropion is that there is no sexual dysfunction. The main thing you need to look out for bupropion is if somebody has low body weight or history of seizures, uh, bulimia, those are all going to lead to an increased risk of seizures. So you don't really want to start bupropion on somebody who's like a really low body weight or has a history of seizures. All right, discontinue sertraline. And, per, and initiate uh, paroxetine. Not really going to get you that much. Um, paroxetine and sertraline are both SSRIs, so you're still going to most likely have similar side effects. You know, there is some utility to switching from one um, drug within the drug class to another to see if that changes some of the side effects. But uh, Paxil or paroxetine is one that I tend not to prescribe early on because it actually has a very, very sedating uh, heavy side effect compared to sertraline. And then discontinue sertraline and uh, refer for electroconvulsive therapy. This would only be something you'd be doing in like end stage uh, or like very refractory depression. And obviously in this patient who's already clinically improving and has nowhere near, you know, the signs of refractory depression, you would not do that. So in this case, we're just definitely going to do bupropion. And you can see the majority of people got this question right as well. Apparently, paroxetine has the highest rate of sexual side effects of all SSRIs, which is something I did not know. So that's a, another today I learned as well. All right, next question. We're blowing through these ones. They're pretty simple this time. So maybe we'll have to go back up to five questions. Um, I don't know. Look how much shorter these uh, question prompts are today. So a 32-year-old woman is evaluated during a follow-up visit for management of stage 3A left breast cancer. 3.5 centimeter grade 3 invasive ductal carcinoma um, estrogen receptor positive, progesterone receptor positive, and HER2 negative with four positive axillary lymph nodes. Uh, which of the following is the most appropriate next step in treatment? So an aromatase inhibitor, luprolide, luprolide and aromatase inhibitor, and tamoxifen. So this is one of the things that I've heard about Mixap um, that some people didn't like, is that it has a lot of very hemonc heavy uh, material and like a lot of specific chemo regimens that honestly the average internist is not going to really be that familiar with. Um, that being said, I think people were also saying that it kind of came up on boards a lot too. Um, I'm not sure if anybody knows anything a little bit more about that in terms of if we actually get all these chemo questions on the boards as well. But just finishing off this question, she has completed neoadjuvant chemotherapy, lumpectomy, and axillary dissection, as well as primary best breast radiation. They just like threw everything at her and... That's good. That's good. <laughs> she resumed menstruation after completing chemotherapy and her estradiol levels are in the premenopausal range. She takes no medications. Physical exam vitals are normal. Healed incisions on the left breast and axilla. There are no breast masses. So this is going to be a hard one for me because I'm not that familiar with this. This is not like my day-to-day -day stuff, but... Um, aromatase inhibitor is basically going to target estrogen receptor. Uh, tamoxifen is also going to be targeting estrogen. Um, but it's going to be an agonist in like the uterus and, um, increase the risk for like endometrial cancer. Um, I think raloxifene is the one where it is still an antagonist in the uterus, um, but it's an agonist in bone. So it can actually be good in patients with osteoporosis. This is something I'll have to look up. And then luprolide is going to be like, um, uh, an inhibitor against GnRH, I believe. So, um, or basically it's like a, I think it's like a growth hormone analog and it secretes it. Basically you just have like a constant level of growth hormone. Uh, whereas normally our GnRH is kind of like secreted in a pulsatile fashion, uh, um, fashion, and that helps regulate our FSH and LH. Um, but if it's like given in just like a constant one, you know, constant rate of, growth hormone or uh, gonadotropin releasing hormone, uh, then it actually causes like negative feedback and just like shuts everything off. HER2 uh, treatment would be like trastuzumab, I believe. Um, so in this case, a uh, little bit of a complicated question for me. Um, obviously they have estrogen receptor positive, so they'd probably respond to all of these treatments. And then they have progesterone receptor positive. Uh, so maybe they'll respond to luprolide as well. I mean, I feel like all of these could be potentially treatments, right? Uh, potentially I'm thinking that if they're trying to avoid, uh, the increasing the risk for uterine cancer, then maybe they would want to avoid tamoxifen and, uh, maybe avoid aromatase inhibitor as well. But then if you just complete, completely shut off their, uh, FSH and LH and all that stuff, 
you're just going to cause like all these crazy symptoms for her uh, as well. So I'm just going to go with an aromatase inhibitor. To be honest, I'm not very clear on this. And yeah, it looks like it was um, luprolide and aromatase inhibitor, which was probably going to be my second choice. Uh, but like, this is such a difficult question for an internist. Like, I, I don't feel like this is like a typical thing that we're going to know. You can see that a majority of people chose tamoxifen, which I think is probably because they saw the estrogen receptor positive. But uh, I think the reason they would favor against doing that is probably to avoid the risk of uterine cancer. So, uh, the most appropriate treatment is luprolide and an aromatase inhibitor. Two prospective randomized controlled trials have shown the superiority of ovarian suppression with luprolide plus an aromatase inhibitor. Like, how am I supposed to know this? I've never seen this or encountered this at all. <laughs> Analyzing the trials together, disease-free survival was 91% versus 88% in the other group. Like, this is so, like, specific. I'm surprised this is in here. So, an aromatase inhibitor is ineffective in premenopausal women uh, unless concomitant ovarian suppression is given with luprolide. Anyways, I'm not that satisfied with ending on that question. I feel like it was kind of a BS question. Maybe I should know this stuff. Who knows? Uh, but let's go on to another question. Wow, so short. Like, just like a three sentence. Like usually my strategy of reading the first line and then the last line is what I do. But like in these questions that are so short, I just read the whole thing. Um, and I was noting, noticing that on the in-training exam as well that uh, you could just read the whole thing instead of doing the whole U-World thing or step one thing where you just like read the first question and then the uh, last sentence. So a 67-year-old woman is admitted to the hospital for aortic valve surgery. Medical history is significant for a history of transphenoidal surgery resulting in panhypopituitarism. She is currently being treated with hydrocortisone, 15 milligrams in the morning and five milligrams in the afternoon, and levothyroxine, 100 micrograms per day. Which of the following is the most appropriate perioperative management beginning on the day of surgery? Interesting. So I did this uh, perioperative medicine guide. And so this is going to be uh, talking about adrenal suppression. And she's taking 20 milligrams a day. She's been taking it for more than 20 days or 21 days, whatever you want to go off of. And so she meets the criteria for um, being high risk for adrenal suppression. And so you treat empirically. You don't need to do cortisol stimulation tests. Um, or cor serum AM cortisol or ACTH simulation test. So in this case, uh, we could just empirically treat and that would be with IV hydrocortisone um, at high dose and then, you know, tapering it. I think in my video, I had talked about it being like 50, 100 and then 50 BID and then 25 BID, something like that. Um, but it's possible it's 50 Q6 and then 25 and then you know, 50 BID and the 25 BID, it might be that kind of taper, but I don't think 25 milligrams of IV hydrocortisone is enough. I don't think there's any indication to giving uh, fludrocortisone or IV levothyroxine. So let's choose B and yep. Wow. I'm, I'm actually impressed that like everybody got this so easy. I mean, I, I guess the other ones don't really make sense. So it, that, that's why most people got this right. All right, next question. A 28-year-old man is evaluated in the emergency department for a piece of food stuck in his esophagus. Biopsy of the esophageal mucosa reveals more than 15 eosinophils per high power field. So this is clearly eosinophilic esophagitis. Uh, which of the following is needed to establish the diagnosis of eosinophilic esophagitis? Eight-week trial of proton pump inhibitor, endoscopic rings, uh, longitudinal furrows, and luminal narrowing, exclusion of other causes of esophageal eosinophilia, or peripheral blood eosinophilia. Um, I know that the treatment of eosinophilic esophagitis should, like, this is a question where, like, you don't even really need to read, um, the, the question most of the time. I, I usually still read it just to make sure, because sometimes they have some useful information in there still. Um, but this is a question that I, I don't know off the top of my head. Um, I know one of the treatments I think is, is PPI. Um, I don't think you need to have these endoscopic findings. Um, you probably do do need to exclude other causes of esophageal eosinophilia. And uh, I don't think you need peripheral blood eosinophilia. So already I'm preemptively thinking C. Uh, a would be treatment. I, I was initially thinking A because I know that's part of the treatment. So maybe like a response to treatment may determine if you know you can make the diagnosis or not. But I feel like C just makes sense. I mean, you've got to exclude other causes of eos uh, like eosinophilia, right? He has an 18-month history of dysphagia with solid food. He has no symptoms of GERD, has no medical problems, and takes no medications. Physical exams are unremarkable. Endos endoscopy shows a food bolus. 
Uh, gentle pressure presses the uh, food bolus into the stomach and the appearance of the esophagus is shown. So I would have to say uh, probably C. That just seems like the most typical like test answer kind of wording. Uh, although I am highly leaning towards A as well. I feel like that's like probably a really good answer as well. Um, because maybe you need to empirically treat them with PPI and then um, and then reassess if they still have uh, eosin eosinophilia. So, oh, man, because the A, the A one was really drawing me at, at the very beginning. Um, but C also just seems like such a, you know, benign thing to do. Yeah, of course you want to exclude other causes of it. Man, I feel bad about this one because I feel like there is something in the diagnostic criteria that they have to have tried, like proton pump inhibitors. Uh, but I'm going to go with C. Uh, I'm a little nervous. Let's see. I think it's... Oh, okay, okay. It's still it's still C. Okay, phew! I did okay. <laughs> so this is what I was getting confused with um, because I have a card that says patient with GERD who, ha who fails six-week PPI trial has atopic triad. Uh, that's kind of suggesting a possible diagnosis of eosinophilic esophagitis. So I think I had, you know, remembered this part of like this failed six week PPI trial. And that's what I was like, oh man, is there something in the diagnostic criteria for failing a PPI trial? So now it's all starting to make sense. So the diagnosis is confirmed with EGD and biopsy showing greater than 15 eosinophils per high powered field. And the treatment is with um, oral uh, aerosolized steroids. And you know what? Look, look at this. This is why I was confused because um, on online med ed, this is what he wrote. He wrote diagnosis, EGD with biopsy of greater than 15 eosinophils uh, and also trial of PPI for six weeks. So now I'm a little bit even more confused. Like, is this trial of PPI like an actual diagnostic criteria? That's why I was so confused. And I was like really trying to like, talk myself into into doing the wrong uh, answer. You can also see this other card that I have that shows the endoscopic appearance does have furrowing, small white exudates, and ring-like indentations, but I doubt that's part of the diagnostic criteria. And so anytime you see this like young male patient with like atopic uh, conditions and then this dysphagia, uh, definitely think of eosinophilic esophagitis. And so now I have to actually go on up to date to actually see if this is part of the diagnostic criteria. Not that this is really going to play a huge role in ever like my practice, but I'm always just curious to, to see. Um, if this is actually part of the uh, diagnosis. So, so the diagnosis of eosinophilic esophagitis requires all of the following. Symptoms related to esophageal dysfunction, eosinophils greater than 15 per high power uh, field, and exclusion of other causes that may be possible. Here we go. In contrast to prior guidelines, persistence of mucosal eosinophilia in the esophagus after two months of treatment with high dose PPI is no longer a diagnostic criterion for eosinophilic esophagitis. So I guess in the past, you know, the, the PPI being part of the diagnostic criteria was actually part of how you diagnose it. Uh, and so that's why this was like a tricky question, like a very subtly, subtly tricky question. All right, anyways, that's going to end this second part of doing questions, board questions with me. Uh, I hope you guys are enjoying it. Obviously, it was a little bit shorter questions this time, not quite as difficult or involved, although we had that difficult chemo question that I didn't really know. But hopefully, it's still fun for you guys to kind of watch my thought process going through this. I've always thought it was, you know, fun to watch people doing their craft, uh, if that's if that's a thing. Like, you know, if you watch people on Twitch or something, just like watching somebody do you know, what they do all the time, like us taking board exams. We take board exams like 24 seven, basically as, as, a, as a physician. I think it's always fun to watch people do that and see them talk through their thought process. And so that's why I thought this would be kind of an engaging series for you guys. So again, let me know in the comments down below what you think. And if you have any comments or suggestions, uh, looking forward to seeing you in the next video and I'll see you next time. Peace. Peace.